2018 is upon us. Um, it's also it's going to be a interesting and possibly groundbreaking year leading into 2019, and the reasons for that are manifold. Um, and here here they are. The first one is that the U.S. Um, under President Donald Trump, for whatever reasons, um, possibly because Barack Obama refused to do so, but Donald Trump has okayed the sending of military equipment to Ukraine. That could be a groundbreaker um, in the Donbass because the whole purpose of Russia holding huge numbers of troops on the Russian side of the Ukrainian border is as a kind of a security guarantee for its two proxy states in Donetsk and Luhansk. Russia would be very reluctant, as it did in August of 2014 and February, uh, January, February of 2015, to uh, send tank columns into Ukraine, knowing that Ukrainian forces had American javelins and other types of weapons that could destroy many of those uh, Russian tanks. So that could be a groundbreaker on the ground. And with the United States now doing this, and remember this is not the only step undertaken by Donald Trump which could be called pro-Ukrainian. Um, he's also appointed as a roving ambassador on the conflict, um, Kurt Volker, uh, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, um, who's doing it, who I know from my time back in sort of seven years ago at uh, John Hopkins University. He was then based there. Um, and he's very good um, in terms of knowledge about Russia. Um, fools will not be able to sort of hoodwink, as it were. And he's also, I, I believe, quite good on Ukraine. Now, both of those steps undertaken by Donald Trump, despite all of the things that are going on around him, the Russia investigation, etc., show him to be actually far better on Ukraine, ironically, than Barack Obama, who came to power in 2008-2009, um, seeking a reset of relations with Russia just after it inv invaded Georgia, uh, which went to nothing as usual. Uh, and also Barack Obama had a very hands-off policy to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, to Russia-Ukraine war, and basically subdelegated this to France and Germany in the EU, which was not good for Ukraine. Now that the U.S. is on board um, with promoting, for example, UN-style peacekeeping forces on the Ukrainian-Russian border, not where Putin wants them on the demarcation line, and the sending of military equipment, all of these uh, are good, as it were, for Ukraine's position in the war. Also, the sending of military equipment could spur other countries to do so, because the signal is, of course, something that countries are waiting from from the US, and those countries would be Canada, of course, Britain, Poland, maybe, and maybe some other countries as well. So that's an important change, as it were, um, in, um, on the ground um, in, in Ukraine. Uh, the second um, potential groundbreaker and change, as it were, which is very significant, is that, um, and it's something that's obviously going to be significant because Russian officials seem to be very, very afraid of these, and these are upcoming, um, which will happen in the next month or so, a new sanctions directed not against Russia, but directed against Russian leading officials. And this is something that um, is a follow-on from earlier tougher U.S. sanctions um, adopted in the summer of last year. Um, they, for the first time, I believe, uh, do something which has been long overdue, and they target Russian officials' assets, bank accounts, and such like, which are hiding in Western um, institutions. Um, it's been no secret for a long time that Russian and many other elites from the former USSR use um, European Union banks and offshore uh, havens like Panama and uh, Virgin Islands and elsewhere to launder their money. 
um, going after these, i.e. going after the pocketbooks of the kleptocrats around Putin is something that they will um, certainly um, find that they will affect them very personally. And that's very good because these kleptocrats like Putin, of course, don't give a damn about the state of Russia or sanctions against Russia. But when it affects their own pocketbook, then they will be some will, will be very affected by it and will take note. So that's something that's coming up as well. So it's the second screw after the tightening of sanctions in the summer of last year. Again, both of these are a follow on from Russia shooting itself in the foot, as it always does, um, with its massive interference in the U.S. presidential elections. And, of course, um, uh, the Russian interference in various elections uh, in, in Western Europe and in the British uh, referendum on Brexit from leaving the Euro European Union and even on the referendum on Scottish independence. So, so Russia um, has shot itself in the foot and this is now rebounding severely on Vladimir Putin, especially at a time when oil prices continue to be very low and Russia cannot buy off the population as it was doing uh, when oil prices were very high between about 2000 and 2008. So that's, that's dangerous. The dangerous side to this is that um, Russia has its own elections this year, and of course there's no question that Putin will win, especially after he's um, banned opposition leaders, Alexei Navalny, from standing. So this big he-man that likes to ride horses with no shirt on and fight tigers and such like is obviously scared of these puny so-called opposition leaders. And um, the problem with, with an election such as like that, if Putin cannot buy off people with populist socioeconomic promises, then will he do something more drastic? Will he, for example, try to, to do something in Ukraine, um, maybe using various um, disturbances organized by Mikhail Saakashvili and, and, and Yulia Tymoshenko and other people? Um, so that is also a danger. Remember that in 2014, when Russia annexed the Crimea, uh, Putin's ratings went through the roof. And, and his annexation of the Crimea was not opposed by even most of the opposition. I mean, very few opposition leaders, Kasparov and Nemtsov, were the only two, as far as I know, who opposed them. Everybody else, including Khodorkovsky and others, support and... and um, and Navalny, as well, supported Russia's annexation of the Crimea. So is Putin going to try something else to try and boost his, his numbers? The signs in Russia are not good for Putin. Of course, he'll win because he still has that nationalist vote. Um, he can obviously do election fraud. He'll, he'll win in the first round. He, the last thing he wants is to go into a second round facing an opposition leader. <coughs> but um, he... Um, he can't really um, artificially boost the turnout. And the big problem in Russia today is boredom and apathy. Um, Putin is not seen as this sort of fresh young face as he was back in 2000 when he replaced Boris Yeltsin or later on when he was the Russian nationalist facing sort of the, the West or the so-called fascists in Ukraine. So all of that's become very tiring and Putin's problem today is apathy um, boredom and of course the, the mobilization of particularly middle class and young Russians which Navalny will continue to do even though he's not able to participate in the elections so this is potentially dangerous on the part of um, Putin um, because he, Putin has never been able to reconcile himself with the fact that his demands for Ukraine which were never realistic, um, have not been accepted by uh, President Poroshenko and cannot be accepted by any Ukrainian patriot president or, or, or patriotic Ukrainian parliament. Because it would, uh, succumbing to Russian demands or Putin's demands would be tantamount to basically surrendering the country to Russian uh, domination, or to, be, to become in effect a, a Russian vassal state. And that's not going to happen. So... So we have two potential groundbreakers 
the sanctions, the new sanctions directed at Russian leaders. We have the, the weapons coming in, which will tilt the balance, make it a more balanced playing field, as it were. But we also have the danger of, of um, Putin seeking to boost, boost his numbers by doing something maybe in the militaristic or nationalistic uh, area. Typically, of course, Putin, if he does that, whether it was in Ukraine in 2014 or in the U.S. in 2016, it'll backfire in the end uh, on Putin. Um, and that's certainly been the case in Ukraine. In this, inside Ukraine itself, um, the uh, Ukraine will hold parliamentary and presidential elections in 2019, and the presidential election campaign will probably begin in the summer or particularly from September of 2018. Um, and at the moment, based on opinion polls, it looks set to be a rerun of 2014, Petro Poroshenko versus Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, Yulia Tymoshenko is giving herself a third try. She lost 2010, 2014, and now it's her third attempt. Ukrainian politics is not like in the West. If you fail once, you go into retirement. That doesn't happen in Ukraine. So that election campaign is potentially um, something that will lead to instability. Um, we already see that with um, Mikhail Saakashvili, uh, who the authorities are trying to deport from Ukraine and with other populist um, leaders like Yuli Tymoshenko and others. So that potential instability in Ukraine running up to the election campaign and then with the election campaign is obviously something that Russia would try to benefit from. Um, so that's a potential also um, change this, this year in Ukraine. If it comes to um, a second round between Poroshenko and Tymoshenko, I probably would put my um, would would believe that Poroshenko would in the end win for all sorts of reasons. Um, but the opinion polls, of course, at the moment are that they are both about at level pegging. Um, but that doesn't mean much at the moment because we're quite a long way from the elections. Remember that Boris Yeltsin in 1996 and Lenny Kuchma in 1999 both started their election campaigns with something like 5% support, and then they went on to win them. So, so it's still a long way on from that. But that is potentially a problem. Obviously, the issues of corruption and justice will be major issues um, in the run-up to the Ukrainian elections and, and, and during the election campaign. But what all of this shows if you look at the domestic politics of Russia and the domestic politics of Ukraine, is that the countries are radically diverging from each other. And what this, this divergence was already beginning prior to 2014 was escalated by uh, Russia's military aggression in 2014 um, and, and will continue this year and next. When you look at surveys of uh, Ukraine attitudes to um, civil society, to political engagement, to human rights, to Europe, to Russia, you see that practically the entire younger generation of Ukraine is lost to Russia. Um, it doesn't matter from which part of Ukraine they're from, they simply have no nostalgia, no interest um, in, 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 in some kind of Russian project or being part of this so-called Uruski Mir Russian world. So that's been lost. Just to give you one example um, of, of, of how that's happening, um, the popul when parents are asked in a recent opinion poll um, what would be the foreign language you would like to teach your children the most, by a, a massive margin English came out on top. Even in the east and south of Ukraine, English um, received about 60% in both of those two regions. Russian came a, a poor second or third with about 20%. So not only are our parents understanding where their future lies, i.e. English is a language of the European Union, regardless of whether Britain remains or not in the European Union. Um, so... There is a danger that Putin will seek distraction by foreign adventures and such like, but 
I don't think that will ultimately make Ukrainians somehow um, become pro-Russian. It'll just make them even more um, wanting to, as it were, leave that Russian world and move westward. Um, that the biggest shock um, in Ukraine, which happened in the 2014, wasn't really on West Ukrainians or young people because they were already kind of moving in that direction or had already arrived in that direction to move towards Europe away from Russia. But the biggest shock came on older people and on Eastern Ukrainians who had mo really believed and had believed the, the, the mythology surrounding the, this idea that Russians were our close brothers and that we were always destined to be together and that they could do nothing wrong with us. Though that kind of group of people is still in shock as to how a brother, so-called, could annex a bit of Ukraine territory and undertake this military aggression. So um, what happened four years ago has its legacy today, and that legacy will continue regardless of the fact there is a danger that Putin will try to seek foreign distractions. Working against the idea that he will seek foreign distractions is that uh, the second round of tough sanctions, the continued resilience of the European Union in voting for sanctions every six months, and also the more level playing field in terms of military uh, hardware between Ukraine and, and Russia. If the, if the Russian side could not defeat Ukrainians in 2014, early 2015, they certainly can't do that today with the Ukrainian army um, being a far better position, far tougher, far more knowledgeable, with even NATO troops now seeking expertise and training and advice from Ukrainians about how hybrid warfare works. That's, that's, Ukraine is now exporting that, that, that knowledge to NATO forces with the danger that maybe Russia will try something in the Baltic states or Poland. So... There are dangers, but I, I, I believe that uh, 2019, um, in terms of international politics, Ukraine um, is in a better place. Um, much of this, as I said before, is down to Russia and Putin always shooting itself in the foot. So please, I hope they will continue to do that. On that note, Happy New Year, and let's see what this year really brings. Thank you.